ministry has been a great blessing. Man, praise the Lord for, a, for the talent and the ability to sing and for the reason to sing and give praise to God, God himself. If you would now, let me invite you to turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, we're going to go over the ministry of John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. In the text this morning, we'll read about two types of baptisms. And uh, as we look into the ministry of John the Baptist, you know, I personally have baptized maybe 50 people. I've, I, I've never kept track, but, you know, a lot of things can happen during a baptism. I remember seeing one YouTube video where a pastor, you know, he's in the pool, and he waved for this uh, grade school boy to come down, and the boy came down in the form of a cannonball <laughs> and landed right in front of the pastor. So things like that can happen. You know, I was, I was baptizing a seven-year-old girl, and I, I wasn't sure if she was ready for it or not, but, you know, we're waiting in the wings in the back, and, um, and she's going, I'm going to swim to you, I'm going to swim to you, I'm swim, swimming to you. You know, I'm like, no, you're not. You're going to walk to me, and you're going to get baptized like, like a, a normal person, right? Um, I, I once baptized a, a, a very large man. He was a, he was a truck driver, a little bit taller than me and almost, you know, another width of me. You know, he had girth, and uh, he had a bad knee, and uh, I told him all that was going to happen. I said, I've never lost anybody, you know, no one's ever drowned in this case, but uh, he, he just wouldn't, he, he fought me when he was getting baptized. Um, he would put his arm down, and he wouldn't go underwater, <laughs> and so I literally had to climb on top of him, and, push, and I got him under, and the waves, man, the waves from all that displacement was, uh, it, was, it was quite the feat, but, um, you know, a lot of things can happen during baptism. I read about this one young pastor who got a little bit worse than what I'd had. You know, he's fresh from a Baptist seminary. He was conducting his first baptismal service. And in his nervousness, he got his scriptures conf confused concerning baptism and the Lord's Supper. So he's baptizing. He goes, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as he lowered the convert into the water, he added, and now drink ye all of it. <laughs> and I <held> him under. <laughs> but... But that didn't happen to me, praise the Lord. But, you know, things can happen during baptism. We're going to look at several types of baptism this morning. The baptism of John, the baptism of repentance, and the baptism in which Jesus Christ will baptize. But go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 3. We'll read verses 1 to 6 for the beginning. <clears throat> the ministry of John the Baptist here, and we'll see the message of John, verses 1 to 6. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so we here see the message of John, and we see through the people, the historical figures, the when of his preaching. Luke names here, by the way, Luke is the most historian-like of all the gospel writers, and he names seven people that are historically verifiable, and, and roughly this is around A.D. 29. We have Tiberius Caesar, the emperor, Pilate the governor, Herod Antipas, the, the, the most famous of the tetrarchs over Galilee, two other tetrarchs, Philip and Licinius, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest that year as well. So, Six secular or seven secular leaders are tied into this verse here. Okay, so secular leaders in secular history tied to scriptural promises of a forerunner of the Messiah. So here, our faith is grounded in history. It is documented. It is, you can't doubt this. More than, more than um, uh, his, historians have recorded these people being uh, leading in this government in this time. So our, our faith is well-grounded in history. But all these, all these hi historical figures, these secular leaders, God's word didn't come to them. God's word was, was not sent to any of them. Instead, the message of God came to John the Baptist, a humble Jewish prophet. 
But everybody had, uh, you know, a dog in the race, so to speak. You know, political Rome, political Israel, religious Israel, they were all concerned about the movement that was occurring with John the Baptist. Thousands, if not tens of thousands, were attending to, the, to, to his ministry. And uh, we see that is about when he preaches, when all these men were leading in their respective spots or positions. We see what he preaches there in verses 3 to 6. He says, repent, essentially, of your sins and be baptized and prepare the way of the Lord. According to Isaiah 40, God's promise, his prophecy, is that God will deliver his people and give them the comfort of salvation. However, to experience this salvation, a certain kind of heart is needed to respond to the gospel call or the good news of God. And this is why John begins preaching the baptism of repentance, as we see there in verse 3. He's preaching the baptism of repentance, and this idea of repentance, literally the simple Greek definition is a change of mind. That's the way a, 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 a secular person would define it, but biblically, repentance is described as a change of mind with a radical change of life. You could tell of the change of mind because the life has been changed as well. So repentance here, the baptism of repentance, is a change of the mind that is so radical that it affects a turning away from sin toward God. So John here is calling the nation to abandon its past ways, to turn to God, to forsake sins, that it would be fit to receive the one who would be coming, the Messiah, the Savior. So this repentance is not just, again, a change of mind, but a change of direction. In fact, it will affect concrete behavior, which we'll see in the next few, few verses here. But I just want to say something about the baptism of John before we go any further. John's baptism is a unique feature. They were familiar, at least the Jews, were familiar with baptism. The Jews baptized Gentile proselytes. If you, want, you were a Gentile and you wanted to get into Judaism, they, you would have to go through a ritual of baptism. It was nothing new to the Jews, especially the Jewish leaders. But the unique, unique thing about this with John is John was baptizing Jews. He, he, this was unusual. If you read Acts 19, verses 1 to 5, there were some people who were baptized by John's baptism who would later have to be baptized by Jesus or Christian baptism, Jesus' baptism. So that's Acts 19, 1 to 5, if you want to read that. But John's baptism looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. In other words, there has to be a moral reformation. Turn from sin. Repent. And then Christian baptism looks back to the finished work of Jesus Christ. So with the appearance of John the Baptist, God commanded that Jews also needed to repent and be washed. So the rite of water baptism, again, performed by John the Baptist, was a requirement that God gave to the Jews It was a baptism of preparation. They were to get prepared for the Messiah. They were to turn from their sin. John preached that the kingdom of God was at hand, and and he was the herald of the Messiah. The Messiah is coming. The nearness of the kingdom of God here was seen in the appearance of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of heaven is at hand because the king is present. So be ready. Repent. Get baptized with the baptism of repentance. This Messiah king was about to be made known, yet Israel was not ready. They were unprepared, and so they were unclean. And so here is the preparation, the baptism of preparation. The Jewish religious leaders, they regarded John's baptizing of Jews as an insult. It was, uh, it was tantamount to making Jews just as unclean as Gentiles. And that was a great offense. And we'll see a little bit later in a few verses that Jesus is willing to submit to John's baptism, the baptism of repentance. You might ask, why would Jesus have to get baptized with the baptism of repentance? He didn't have any sin to repent of. I think the main reason that Jesus submits to John's baptism, even insisting on it when John didn't want to baptize him, Jesus was submitting to John's baptism because his role as the Messiah was necessary to identify with the Jews, the ones he came to save, and all men and all women. 
It was a requirement for God's law for Israel. And so in his identification with his people, Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. In essence, Jesus put his stamp of approval on God's causing John the Baptist to preach the baptism of repentance. So we see when Jesus enters into the Jordan River to be baptized by John, it's the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Not only is it a stamp of approval of John's preaching and his ministry, not only did Jesus identify himself with the sin of his people, when he was baptized, he was also anointed with the Holy Spirit for ministry. In one sense, Jesus' baptism and, and the coming down of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove was Jesus' ordination. It was where Jesus would begin full-time ministry empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. It was his anointing. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit of God. You'll read in Luke chapter 4, verse 21, where Jesus says, the Lord has anointed me. He'll read the scripture from Isaiah, and he'll say, this day is this prophecy fulfilled. God has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And I think it's this occasion when Jesus gets baptized when that is the case. So that's Luke 4, 21, if you want to follow through with that. But look at verse 4 now. In verse 4, it says, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. So John was a prophet who was the subject of prophecy. He is the forerunner. He's the one that would be coming. He would be the voice crying out in the wilderness. So, you know, literally he was in the wilderness along the Jordan River. Personally, I think he was at a place called Bethabara where, uh, where um, Joshua and the people crossed the river and then set up 12 stones of remembrance. I think those are the stones that John will point to and say, don't say, don't say that because you're children of Abraham that you're, you're a child of God or a child of his covenant. God can even raise from these stones, these 12 stones of remembrance, children of God, children of Abraham. But anyway, um, John 4, he, he says some things about preaching in the wilderness. It says... As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Metaphorically speaking here, Israel was a wilderness. They were dry and fruitless. They were barren and crusted with legalism by Pharisees and, and, and um, self-righteous Jewish leaders. It was an arid and a cheerless nation. And so in order for them to be ready for the coming of the Lord, the people had to go or undergo a moral change. The picture here, as it's stated in verse 4, that there had to be a coming in which prepare the way of the Lord to make his path straight, right? Every, every, Every valley shall be filled, every hill and mountain shall be brought low, all these this picture that is that is given to us through this prophecy of Isaiah, which is John will be fulfilling. John called upon people to do something, okay? It was not a matter of repairing the literal roads or flattening the mountains. It was a matter of preparing their own hearts to receive the Messiah who would come. And I think in picture when he says, every valley shall be filled, every mountain shall be brought low, every crooked way will be made straight, is a metaphorical picture of what individuals will have to do with their own hearts, For instance, the effects of Christ's coming are described as followed here. Every valley shall be filled. In other words, those who are truly repentant and and humble themselves, they will be filled. They will be saved and satisfied and filled with the goodness of God. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low. Those who are proud and self-righteous like the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees who tried to earn their way into heaven, they who were haughty and arrogant, They would be brought low. They would be humbled. They would have to humble themselves, if not humbled by God. The crooked places shall be made straight. Those who are dishonest, those who we would call shysters and crooked like the tax collectors, they themselves would have their characters straightened out. These crooked ones would have to be straightened out. And those where where the text says, In the rough ways shall be made smooth. Soldiers and others with rough and crude temperaments and character, they would have to be tamed and refined. 
I think in the context, that's the metaphor because we'll see those people asking John, what should we do? How shall we prove our repentance or show our repentance sincere? Look at verse 6. It says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The final result as, as, as you're preparing for the king and the Messiah to come is that all flesh, not only Jews, but Gentiles as well, they shall see the salvation of God. So we see the when, during the time when those leaders were. We see the what, the baptism of repentance and the preparing of the way, getting ready to receive the Messiah, being, being willing to turn from sin and to believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah the King. So now let's look at verse 7 here as we see who, who he preaches to. Verse 7, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So here we have who? Who, who are they preaching to? The Jewish, the Jewish leaders and the lay people. He's blunt. He's not politically correct. Now look at verse 9. He warns of judgment. Okay, he says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So to, to the religious leaders, to the lay people, he is, he is warning Look, Christ's coming is going to test the reality of your repentance. Christ's coming will reveal the thoughts and, and, and intents of your heart and what you believe about him. The ax is laid to the root of the tree. This is a powerful metaphor. This is speaking about judgment to come because it's going to happen. If you did not manifest the fruits of repentance, you'd be condemned Listen to the the words here. He says, generation of vipers. Vipers, snakes, serpents were the most unclean animals as, as, as far as the Jews were concerned. He warns of the wrath to come. He speaks of an axe. He speaks of a tree being hewn down and cast into the fire. So these God, God's prophets here, he being the, old, the last of the Old Testament prophets, he was not politically correct. He was a great moralist. Look, turn from sin. Their words came crashing upon the, the, the helmets of their foes. Look, this is what God requires. Repent. Turn from sin. Change your mind about the direction of your life. Prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Now look at verse 10. Okay, the people knew. They understood. Okay, uh, they were getting it. In verse 10, they asked the question. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said unto him, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. So the crowds understand the message, and they ask, Look, what can I do to be holy? What can I do to avoid uh, the coming judgment or the wrath to come when the axe is laid to the root of the tree and those that are unfruitful will be cast into the lake of fire? They understood it's not the physical act of baptism that was the main issue here. The main issue, rather, is responding to God with a certain kind of heart, a certain kind of life. So they ask, what shall we do? And he's very specific. He gives specific ways in which they could prove the sincerity of their change of heart, their repentance. We see that in verse 11 and 12 here. Let's look at verse 12. Okay? And in generally speaking, he says, look, if you got money... Help with those who don't have money. If you got food, if you got clothes, give those who don't have clothes. Okay, if you got more food than you need, share your food with those who need it. That's a general blanket. This is, this is one way you can repent. Change the way you live. Change the way you think. And in verse 12, other people come. More specific. Then came also the publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. So here are the tax collectors, the publicans, the, the most despised of, of Jews in Israel. They were considered traitors. They bought franchises, tax franchises from, from, from the Roman government, agreed upon price, agreed, uh, agreed upon cut the Romans would get, and they would get a certain portion, and some of them would cheat. 
and thus they were despised. And they, they said, okay, what do we need to do? Okay, they understood. It's not just get baptized in water, but I need to turn from a sin. What do we need to do? And he's very specific to them. Don't exact more than is right. Whatever you agreed upon, what is righteous, stay. Don't tax more. That is what you should do. They were notoriously crooked, and so they would have to be straightened. Let the crooked be made straight. Now, verse 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So soldiers who are on active duty, Roman soldiers here, they were to avoid three sins that, that were common to soldiers. One, the first one, do no violence. Okay, literally, the Greek word is don't shake, don't extort, don't shake down people for money. Don't slander. And listen, you got into the uh, Roman soldiering and you agreed to the price. Be content with what your pay was. It's important, again, to realize here, as we go forward, these people, these men, women, were not saved by doing things. Rather, these were the outward evidences that their hearts were truly right before God and ready to receive Messiah the King, the Savior. Um, let's skip a few verses. Here's another set of people that John preached to and affected. Jump down to verse 19. In verse 19, it says, But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him, that is John the Baptist, for Herodias his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evil which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So Luke, the historian, kind of clumps up everything that's happening with John in chapter 3. So after, after John's story is done, all the focus will be on Jesus from here on out. So King Herod, essentially, married his brother's wife, who was also his niece, so he was guilty of adultery and incest and all the other wicked things that he did. It led to John's imprisonment and eventually led to his beheading, his death. John, it's believed he, his ministry lasted no longer than a year, but thousands and thousands of people were responding. And that's why it caught the attention of Herod as well as the religious leaders of Israel. So here we have... John's ministry, a ministry that we ought to parallel or model or copy. He gave specific instructions for his converts on how to put their faith into practice. He was a fruit inspector. He looked at people's lives, and if there wasn't fruit, he said, listen, the ax is laid to the root of the tree, and if you're not careful, that tree is going to be brought down and you'll be thrown in the lake of fire. You'll be cast into the fire. He was a, root, a fruit inspector, and he got to the root of the problem. He didn't dilly-dally. He wasn't politically correct. He got to the root of the problem. It's your sin. Turn from it. Turn from your sin, because who has warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Judgment is coming. Is there fruit? Turn from your sin, because there's one coming who's mightier than I. I baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I believe it means the fire of judgment, but we'll talk about that in a minute here. So what do we draw from this, this application from just these uh, the 20 or so verses? We see that without true repentance, no soul is ever truly saved. True repentance shows or demonstrates or manifests itself in changed behavior, a changed life, a changed direction. Truly repentant people, as was alluded to here, they will have a different view of wealth. If they have more than they need, they share. They will refuse to abuse the power that they have in the position that they have. Herod, the soldiers... 
True repentance will affect a change of life, but that's only half. Because that's why John would say there's some, someone coming who is mightier than me. So the question is, have you repented, truly repented? Has your life been changed? Let's look at verse 15 now. It says, as the people were in expectation, by the way, by that time, um, there was an expectation of the Messiah. Many people had d- did the math through uh, Daniel's prophecies, realizing that the Messiah was supposed to become around this time. And uh, according to the historians, maybe 50 or so, give or take, false messiahs appeared around this time. So verse 15 says, and as the people were in expectation, there was an expectation of messianic um, comings. And all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. John answered, saying unto them all, saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, that who's the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, and the chaff will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people." We see here a misunderstanding of his ministry because some men mused. They thought there was a little bit of confusion here. Some thought, oh, then he is the Messiah. As verse 15 says, men mused in their hearts. They started to think. By the way, it's a good sign. If you're witnessing to somebody and they start to think and they start to ask questions about your faith, it's a good sign because you can't get saved without thinking. You need to be able to think about the truth of God's word and to respond to it. And so when they come, whether they're skeptical or not, me, I would rather have skeptical people who are angry, you know, whether they were hot or cold. You know, you can't do much with neutral or, you know, stagnant. But if someone fights you in regards to the faith, hey, they're thinking, and you need to just keep preaching the word, preaching the word, because the word will break through if they're willing. So now we see men begin to think, and John could have, you know, they're thinking, he's the Messiah. He could have stole some of the Messiah's glory, but instead he compares himself unfavorably with Christ. In fact, he says, you know what, of the lowest of the lowest slaves in in, in our country, I'm not even like them, okay? I'm lower than them. People would come to a wealthy man's house, and the the lowest slave on the rung in the household would go and and wash uh, the guest's feet. John says, I I'm even lower than that. I'm not even fit to unloose or untie the sandals that Jesus wears. So he does give Jesus the glory, and he explains the difference between his baptism and the baptism of the Messiah. Back in verse 16, he says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So we have the clarification here. Okay, I am not the Messiah. He's going to come. I baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I don't believe the fire metaphor here refers to uh, the coming of the fire uh, of the Holy Spirit on the heads of those who would during the time of Pentecost. That's not a baptism picture. In context here, I think the fire that here that John is talking about, about Jesus bringing and, and baptizing with the Holy Spirit and with fire, I think that has to do with the fire of judgment. It's interesting to note, if you read Mark and Matthew, whenever, whenever John is speaking to believers only, he omits the baptism of fire. He doesn't say the baptism of fire. No true believer will ever experience the baptism of the fire of judgment. I think that's what it's talking about because right immediately next to what he says here is the fire that is you know, the tree that is brought down, that's hewn down and cast into the fire. I think the immediate context, the understanding of how Jesus will baptize with the Spirit and then with fire, I think the fire has to do with the fire of judgment. It's not the fire of the day of Pentecost. So here's that clarification again. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Today, the moment a sinner trusts Jesus Christ, he is baptized he is baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 13. But again, what is this baptism of fire? I think it's the baptism of judgment. We have that in verse 9 here and verse 17. It's the baptism of judgment, not of blessing. 
he, he's, the, the picture is given that Jesus is pictured or the Lord is pictured as a winner, winnower of grain, you know. You, you take the shovel, you toss the grain in the air, the wind drives away the chaff, the, the waste, the good stuff falls to the ground. The waste then is taken and burned in the fire. I think that's referring to the fire of judgment. So all unbelievers will experience a baptism of judgment in the lake of fire. So those who accept Jesus as the Messiah, they'll experience the joy. And if you want to use fire of some sorts, the purification fire of the Holy Spirit, but those who reject him will suffer the eternal consequences of the fires of judgment. Now here, let's jump to verse 21 as I close here. It says, when, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee am I well pleased. So already now we see that, that the baptizing ministry of John the Baptist, he baptizes the converts of Israel, telling them repentance in the water. The, the, his, his, his baptism is the baptism of repentance, baptism by water. But he also now we see baptizes the Christ of Israel. You can read Mark. Mark 1, Matthew 1, to see the parallel passages. Jesus is not baptized for his own sin. He's baptized in order to identify with his people and also to, to verify or um, give his stamp of approval on the ministry and the baptism of John the Baptist. But here, there's something unique found in Luke here. Luke says as Jesus is being baptized, he's praying. Luke, the great physician, not the great physician, the physician, he is always concerned about human responsibility and the responsibility to do right, to treat your body right, to, to, to live right, to turn from sin, to keep in constant communion with God through prayer. And he shows that time and again with Jesus. Jesus, though being the Son of God, continually in fellowship with God through prayer. And it is at that moment of prayer where the third person of the Trinity comes. The Holy Spirit of God descends down upon him. We've sung it today. Okay, we sang the hymns, uh, Spirit of God, descend upon me. Okay, enlighten me, illumine me, guide me, direct me. And so we have here now Jesus being anointed as the Messiah. All members of the Trinity are present. By the way, those who don't believe in the Trinity, they wrestle with this. They can't explain this passage away. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are present. And so as we close here, Jesus will baptize you with fire, or baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and then with fire for those who don't believe. But here, we review the big ideas here. John baptized with water, but Christ will bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you repented of your sin and believed? If you have, you've been baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit. You've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you haven't, God is going to look at your life, the fruit of it. And if there is none, the axe will be laid to the root of the tree and the fires of judgment will come. And I, like John, and like every believer, has a responsibility and should have a certain urgency to say, turn, turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We have to communicate to people that they are accountable to God and culpable to God. They will answer to God one day for their life. Are you, are you willing to do what John did here? John's calling is our calling. Remember what he said, prepare ye the way of the Lord? Our responsibility is help people to be prepared for the Messiah. Turn from sin. Look at the fruit in their life. Warn them of the judgment that is to come. Flee from the wrath that is to come. The calling, again, of believers today is the same as John's. Prepare the way for others. Are you living a holy life where others can see, hey, there is a difference? 
Are you living in such a way that there is joy and grace where they say, hey, you've got something that I don't, and I want it. How is it that you're so strong in times of trial? How is it that you're not pulling your hair out when our, our, our country is going down, down the, the, the tubes? And you say, it's because I know God. I'm prepared. Are you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the riches of your grace. For it is in you that we trust and move and have our being. We thank you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, being baptized into the body of Christ at the moment of salvation. We thank you that we have his, his indwelling, the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit that we might not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Help us, Lord, to walk in a way as to give you joy and not grief. To live with hope to live with joy, to live in peace before the world among people who have no hope, who have no joy, and who have no peace. Thank you for the peace we have with you through, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us now as we draw near to you in observing your broken body in your shed blood, which was shed for us. Lord, help us to always remember the price that was paid. Help us to always remember why you did it. For the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross, that you might bring many sons, many daughters, many children into glory that your family would increase, that heaven would be stocked with those who love you. Help us to draw near in sobriety of heart, yet joy of mind and of spirit. Bless the time of, of observing the table, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.